Hello? Oh, it's working now. Hi. You see my pure antimony in the background? Okay. So, I had a lot of fun yesterday going through videos and interpreting everyday normal things into cult language. And, uh, yes, Maxi? I want to do it again. I, am I taking a risk by going back to that Scientology video and watching the rest of it? I think I am, because I think I'm too quick to react to, them, to things. But I kind of want to take that risk. So I don't know if I should start with that or if I should start in the day in the life of a teacher. You know, I actually, so I tag all the content creators whose videos I use. I include the title in the description of my videos and then I tag the people. So I wonder if anyone from the Indian Prairie School District watched my video. And they saw their names pop up and they were like, how did we end up in here? So, I'm going to start with the Church of Scientology, and I'm just going to listen as much as I can, because I have no idea what her story is. All I know is that I started feeling very weird after hearing the story of Scientology itself. So let's start here. I'm just, I'm going to do my best. Remember, I have no context for what her life was like. So far, all I know is that she went to boarding school. And she met her husband here. And he wanted to be an actor and do normal things. And they didn't like that, but Tom Cruise is an actor. So I'm not sure what he means by that. What else do I know? They made them... Uh, move gravel and wheelbarrows for cactus gardens. And do manual labor for 35 hours a week. Which just sounds like part of their curriculum. Um, digging irrigation ditches. is probably something you have to do when you live out somewhere where... I don't know. It's not a city. But you know. Where were they? I'm going to Google that. So, did I Google the girl yesterday? Miscavige Hill. So, her grandparents and her parents were part of Scientology. <clears throat> and her uncle is a leader in Scientology. Oh, she has a website, but they don't link the website on Wikipedia. I'm just trying to do a little bit of research so that I have some context for what she's talking about. xscientologykids.com. This is good. <laughs> Has anyone ever left Scientology and then returned to it? Like Rum Springer? <laughs> Scientology's disconnection policy. Is that an official doc? This is how I do research. The practice of disconnection is a form of shunning. As someone who is part of an organization that people consistently confuse as a, with a cult, 
I will tell you that if I have to disconnect from family members for my own sanity, I will do that. Because I don't want to hear your opinion about something that you aren't asking me about. You aren't trying to understand. And you're just consistently, just like people are doing to Miley Cyrus, putting me down because of the things that I'm choosing. Telling me that I'm not intelligent enough to make my own decisions. Telling me that I'm manipulated, even though I'm 35 years old. And I was 28 when I found this place. Which is not only legally an adult, but also physically an adult. With enough life experience. And I'm not even getting into the whole story because I've talked about it before and maybe another time will be better. To know the difference between someone who's taking advantage of me and someone who actually cares about me. Someone who's providing something of value and someone who's not. So if I have to, if all of our conversations are just going to come back to you trying to save me, I'm going to stop talking to you. It's not a form of shunning. It's a form of shutting you out. Because our conversations are no longer productive. There is no Scientology disconnection policy. This is from the official Church of Scientology. They don't require church members to disconnect from anyone. They either deal with it or they don't. It's a matter of how they want to spend their time and what kind of relationships they want to maintain. Because they're people with free will. Some of us were denied a proper education. Why? What are the OTIII materials? Oh! I should watch um, that celebrity that they just showed a picture of and her experience in Scientology. But I don't really want to. It would be different because Miley Cyrus didn't ask to be dragged in and down by the modern mystery school and her potential association with it. That lady whose picture I just saw did ask for that <clears throat> by doing it. Um, what is the C org? The senior most status of staff. So there are people who have uh, put in a lot of effort to maintain the organization. She was only allowed to see them once a week, or she was only able to see them once a week because they were so freaking busy. At age eight, she signed her own billion year contract, <coughs> effectively agreeing to follow their rules for life. I can't believe people use this as a talking point. You do understand that this is a an exercise that people do with children to help them envision their future and how the part organization that they're participating in, whether it's a school or a preschool or a daycare, but I guess you would be too young if you were in daycare, like an after school program, or just someone who cares about your future, they're going to have this exercise in their arsenal of how that organization can support you in fulfilling your dreams in life at eight years old I do it now as an adult I don't think that I signed a billion year contract with the modern mystery school because I wrote down things that I wanted to do and I wrote down the ways that I wanted the lineage and the school to help me with those things it's not going to hold up in court especially not if it's signed by an eight year old and it's not going to hold up in the court of Mm. It's a contract you make with the universe. And the fact that adults really want to be known for people who are distorting this exercise as a way to prove that they were emotionally manipulated is absolutely ridiculous to me.
She was expected to do heavy manual labor for 25 hours a week. You know who else is expected to do heavy manual labor for 25 hours a week? People who have jobs. Teenagers. Sometimes even children whose parents are teaching them life skills, like being able to chop firewood. <laughs> I'm eating chocolate chips. I should stop. I need to um, and dig ditches. And do things that not only build up your mental and emotional and physical strength, but that will help you survive if you were ever in a situation where you didn't have someone else to rely on in life. <clears throat> we were also required to write down all transgressions. After writing them, we would receive a meter check to make sure we weren't hiding anything. And you have to keep writing until you came up clean. This just sounds like another exercise to get children to reflect on what they've done and, and where they want to improve. <laughs> the electropsychometer is just a tool that someone uses to be like, I think you still have more to write. I think that you are avoiding this. So the ranch that she's talking about, I saw a woman on TikTok who was talking about living at the ranch. And transgressions are just things that weigh heavy on your conscience. So there's probably just a way of getting you to let go of the things that you were holding on to. Hill claims she was given repeated security checks, investigations looking for confessions of misdemeanors from past and present lives. So they were just asking you to meditate on where you were holding on to guilt and shame and things that might have been holding you back from experiencing joy in life and just write them down so you can burn them and let them go. Hill claims she was considered a potential risk to Scientology's public profile and the confessions were taken to use against her later if she spoke out publicly. She was a student in a boarding school where if she had to write down things that she felt guilty about, she might have done things that would have spoken to her character as a teenager. And so... If she was to speak out publicly, they have proof of, of um, not defects of character, because this is something that you do when you're in addiction recovery. But they have an inventory of her personal profile behavioral patterns so did she leave the school oh she left the ranch in 1997 what's the CMO So she's saying after she left the branch in 1997, she was training in the CMO. And that's where all of this happened. And she was 16 when her parents left Scientology in 2000. I'm so confused. So she was at the ranch when she was young. Okay, and then the Scientology ordered practice of disconnection. It's not an <laughs> uh, 
I wasn't there. Hill met her husband as a Scientologist in 2001. So in 2004, they were sent to Australia, and that was the first time she was able to watch TV and the internet. And get to the internet. And she, well, when was the internet invented? I mean, when was the internet, when was social media invented? 1997? What did it start with? MySpace? SixDegrees.com. Oh my goodness. So she started reading other people's outside opinions of Scientology. Sounds like she got brainwashed by the article. Hmm. They were pressured to sign agreements which would entitle the church to claim... $10,000 each time she spoke out publicly against them. So they wanted her to sign an NDA, not sharing the teachings. And if she did, then she would have to pay a penalty. Because, again, you can't sign away your right to speak the truth about negative things. Or you just can't ruin someone's reputation with things that aren't true. They can't speak to their children. Oh, goodness. I don't know if I want to watch this. I don't think I can handle it. All right, let's just go for it. Through Scientology, can our thetans be clear? Do you ever think that you might be quite mad? Oh, yes. The one man in the world who never believes he's mad is a madman. Hubbard died in 1986, but his teachings, based seemingly on a mix of science fiction and psychoanalysis, continues today. Anxiety. We had pictures of him in every room, pretty much. You know, we we had to clap to his picture at the end of every day, several times a day, even. Since its inception, Scientology... But she doesn't provide any context for the clapping. Was it because they were celebrating things that he had done to keep the school alive or to help it grow? There are pictures of Sovereign Obsessimus Dave in every hallway in the Modern Mystery School International uh, building because he's built it. And he wrote a book. G has come under intense scrutiny, but never more so If he sees this video, he's going to make us applaud every time we turn a corner. So then now, after a number of former church members have made serious allegations of abuse and mistreatment. You're not encouraged to have children, are you? Or are you banned from having children? Or are you taught to think critically about your decision to have children and to consider the fact that sex is what creates them? And so, if you would like to have sex, you should also consider the potential that you're going to have children and that children cost money and resources and time. And you want to be sure that you're fully prepared and you have a strong foundation to be able to have those children before deciding to have them and taking responsibility for the actions that lead to you having them. Well, regular Scientologists are allowed to have children, but members of the Sea Org are not allowed to have children. And if you feel pregnant, what would happen? Many people are coerced into having abortions, guilted into it, told that, well, you're not following your billion, your contract, you're betraying us. It's such a serious allegation to make that you're encouraged or, or, or made to think that an abortion is an appropriate action. It is. serious but it's completely true it's like many people many friends of mine um i've even seen it happen in some cases um so yes it's very serious but it's completely it's completely the truth 
For those who broke any of the church rules, punishment could take many forms. Dallas claims it meant being locked in the basement of this building. We had premarital sex and we got in trouble. And I was in a basement for two weeks and told that. It doesn't provide any context for the premarital sex. Was it in public? Was it somewhere where people walked in on you that didn't need to see you doing it? Were you breaking the rules in some other way? <clears throat> and if I didn't cooperate, I'd never see Jen again and I'd never see my parents again. Yeah, this just sounds like a good dad. Well, except for the part about not seeing your parents again. I don't quite understand. From what I've gathered, does it just mean you would be forced to leave the church? Because you were being disrespectful to the rules? The church has categorically denied Dallas's allegations. Of course they have. Scientology owes much of its high profile to Hollywood. A number of its stars who have embraced the church, including Tom Cruise. I do what I can. And I do it the way I do everything. <laughs> There's nothing part of the way. <laughs> Cruz and David Miscavige, the church leader, are said to be close friends. But according to Dallas, who worked at the Scientology Celebrity Center, there had at one time been some concerns. And Tom Cruz is for many the, the base of Scientology name in the church. Um, when you were there, Dallas, so you were aware that Nicole Kidman had some influence on how he was being viewed. Well, yeah, when I was at the celebrity church, he wasn't around. He wasn't on services, and I was told from them that it was because Nicole Kidman was an influence on him. And not a good one. And not a good one. Is it possible for Tom Cruise? Didn't they, weren't they married? So was the influence just that he was, they were heartbroken and they didn't want to be around each other because it was too difficult? Just to have a, a partner and not, um, who, who's not a participant of the church and stay in the church? As a Scientologist, you believe that Scientology is going to save that person. So if you really love someone, there's almost no chance that you wouldn't do everything you could to make them into a Scientologist. Do I address this in some way from my perspective as a mystery school student? I will. So here's my perspective as a mystery school student. The tools of the lineage have made my life infinitely better than it was before I found the school. And everything I've done, it has gotten better and better each time. Life activation, empower thyself initiation, Full of Spirit Activation, Healer's Academy, Kabbalah, Ritual Master Initiation, and then all the, the things before that and after that. It's made my life better. At one point, I believed that I should not date people who are not initiated because the gaps between us would just be too big. And in a lot of ways, that's been true. I don't know why my lights are flashing like that. It feels like I'm destroying the matrix by making this video. Um, that has been true. It's been really difficult for me to have positive relationships with people who are not in the lineage, who I knew before, but mostly for the reasons that I stated earlier, is that the conversations that we have stop being constructive because of the narrative that they've consumed from the Vice article, mostly. Even if I'm the one that introduced them to the article, explaining my position on things 
and our conversations just become I'm a victim in some way and so they talk to me as if I'm a victim which is really annoying it's disrespectful it's rude and it breaks down communication between us because no matter what I say in response to that they're convinced that they are right about my experiences and that's not really a fun conversation to have so I am meeting people now who are to my knowledge not life activated or initiated and I'm able to build relationships with them and have conversations with them and I in no way feel a need or a desire to force them to join me as an as a initiate or a student. I'm available if they would like to question or like to learn or like to experience the tools that I have to share. Sometimes, like if I'm attracted to somebody, I don't want them to be my client. I want to date them. <laughs> And if they're interested, I want to redirect them to somebody whose client they can be so they can experience the tools of the lineage without it interfering with our relationship. But I in no way want to force anyone to do what I'm doing in any capacity, whether it's lineage or just like going dancing. I'm not even the kind of person who, um, if I have plans to do something and you aren't that interested in doing them, I'm not going to sit here and beg you to do them. I'm not going to guilt you into doing them. At one point, like I said before, I was, I was under the impression that it would be good if the people that I cared about joined me. And if I could serve them and help them in some way. But I also had to realize that that's very cult-like thinking. The school didn't program me with that. In fact, the school is what's deprogramming me from thinking that way. <clears throat> Having been born and bred a Scientologist and as the niece of David Miscavige, any thoughts of leaving were always going to be a challenge for Jenna. But the idea took seed when the church sent Jenna and Dallas to work in Australia. That was a turning point, you say, for both of you. Yeah. Yes. Why? Because I had never been around non-Scientologists in my life before. So it was an interesting chance to see that, you know, no, not everyone is a Scientologist. Not everyone is in love with Scientology. And they were actually kind of normal and pretty cool. And all of a sudden you could see everything for what it was, how controlled it was. This is definitely how... This is how all kids feel when we get exposed to the world, no matter what our lives were like growing up. Because you just don't know what you don't know until you experience it. The decision to leave the church caused Dallas and Jenna enormous heartache. They claimed they were pressured to stay, with threats they would lose all contact with their families. Jenna says she considered suicide. Y you did stand on a ledge and tell them you would jump. Mm -hmm. That's a fairly extreme position to take. That was the only option I had. I mean, they had taken everything else away from me. They'd taken away my family. They moved me away from my friends so many times. Now they were taking Dallas away. You know, what else could I do? All I knew is that the church feared bad publicity. It seems to me it still hurts you to this day. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, he's crying. Tough. Sorry. It's okay. Clearly, it was yeah. a terrible time. Yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, it, there's... Who knows what would have happened? That's the scary thing, is they have so much control and so much mind control over you that... You, you can go on 60 Minutes their whim. and tell your story. Castle Canyon School was a big property. It was beautiful. It was a nice place for kids to grow up. The church has denied all of Jenna's allegations, describing them as tabloid tales 
which should be taken with a grain of salt. And it has set up a Look, she's farming. To refute her claims about and they're in a the greenhouse. I love the this is exactly what I pictured. I mean, this is amazing. Like, who gets an experience of working on a farm these days? Not very many people, well, and it's an awesome Hannes experience. Declared that you're a liar. Mm -hmm. Are you a liar? No, everything I'm saying is completely true. The church is the liars, you know? I mean, there's so many stories like mine out there that corroborate each other and that they just can't keep a handle on it anymore. You are accused of exploiting your uncle's name. Mm -hmm. You're cashing in on being a miscarriage. Right. I mean, it's just like what I'm saying is the truth. If by nature of me having his name brings more attention to it, then awesome, because it should. Jenner and Dallas now so this is like in Meghan Southern Markle California. and Prince Jenner has written Harry a book about her William? time she in married? the church. Who is she married to? I feel like that now, guy. finally, I feel like I know myself, you know, I have my own family, I know what I want. Their parents to children Archie and Winnie. He always wanted to be famous, right? Life, they say they he almost always wanted lost. to be an actor. We're all different. We all have something well, to give. And so to me, Nixon. the fact that Scientology takes away the chance for people to live their lives and be who they are, to me, that's what makes it dangerous. It's like, uh, like a crime against humanity, against life itself. Hello, I'm Tom Steifert. Thank you for watching 60 Minutes. This I want to go watch the teacher movie now. Ooh, inside an American cult-like religion linked to a deadly freeway crash. Oh, how did you link the two? We're going to add that to watch later. Oh, Leah Ramini. She's not the one that I was thinking of. Oh, is she the one I was thinking of? Yeah, she looks like the one from uh, Charmed. Scientology's devious tricks to hold its members hostage. Oh, this is fun. We're going down a Scientology rabbit hole together. But not today, because I want to go watch the teacher movie. Okay, history. And then... We're going to do this one. This is... Oh, Day in the Life of a Japanese on Day in the Life of a Teacher. Hey guys, today I wanted to do a Day in the Life of a Teacher. <laughs> So I'm going to take you behind the scenes and show you what it is that I do on a day-to-day -day basis in kindergarten. I hope she touches a lot of children. And then a lot of children touch her. Because... Ooh. It's good for all of us. You know? So the first thing that I like to do when I enter into my classroom is turn on all of my lamps and fix my pillows. I'm a little OCD about my pillows. So I turn my lights on and I go ahead and start taking out all of my materials that I've kind of brought home. So I take out my planner, I take out my teacher planner, my laptop, my Diet Coke, which is very important for me to start the morning. And I just kind of start to get myself situated. Once I take out all of my things, I like to oh, open she has up an my art binder. planner and flip to today's lesson. So I, I quickly just binders. kind of look over what it is that I'm doing for the day, just so that I can have a great idea of my, pretty much my plan for the day. I also turn on my laptop, which takes a little bit for it to get started. I know you thought I was watching this video so I could react to it with the cult narrative, and that might happen, but honestly, I just want to learn how to be a teacher. Did. And I will take my teacher planner and place it on my black desk. This is where I do all of my instructions. So I like to make sure that my lesson plans are right in front of me at all times. This is where she's planning the manual labor for the children. Once my students walk into my classroom, they get started with their canning jar right away. So I'm busy while they're doing that, helping other students, and I'm taking out my assessments for the day. So once my kids finish up with their accounting jar, they bring that to me so that I can quickly check over it. The announcements will... Highly regulated and monitored environment. They weren't just teaching us, they were observing us. Come on around 7.50 in the morning. So as soon as the oh. announcements... 
now we have to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and we all know how totalitarian that ritual is. Come on, I have my kids all stop. We all stand together. We face the flag, and we say the Pledge of Allegiance. By the way, I love saying the Pledge of Allegiance. If you've ever seen me in a school, in the last two months, you know that as soon as I hear it, I stop, and I do it, okay? Once that is finished, announcements are over, I like to make sure that I stop my class and I kind of just double check and make sure that everybody's inside of my room and unpacked. Then I give them directions as to what they're doing. I'll go over the daily data question, I'll tell them to complete their accounting jar, and then I'll let them know about their task that they have for that day. That is such a kind way to teach people. Tell them what to expect during the day and your plan for them that you prepared ahead of time, like the night before. or that fits into your overall plan for the whole school year. As my students are working on their cannon jar and morning activities, I'm doing a couple of assessments in- Sorry, I know you don't have the context for why this is, I'm annoyed. It's okay, I'm not annoyed at this teacher. In the morning, I'll even get together a small group that we can quickly just go over some of those different skills that I've noticed that some of the kids are maybe maybe having issues with. So I will do a quick small group with them and go over some of these. Here I'm doing a math small group. Aww. Look, she's demonstrating patience and understanding and kindness about where they might be struggling and how she can provide clarity so that they're not struggling anymore. Next up comes my intervention time. So this is the time when I'm working. And if they are struggling, she probably just provides more clarity. And with those students who need just some extra support. So I'll pull them and we begin working on some of those skills that they need. Hmm. See, told you. When they're in Once school, because this is appropriate behavior for school. This is appropriate behavior for school of all ages if you're in school and you're learning. They'll start cleaning up and making their way to the carpet. The first thing that we like to do once we get to the carpet is sing our good morning song. So we sing that standing up. Oh, this is the, this is the, uh, all the whole country has to do this together. We should probably leave China alone. So we can get ourselves pumped up and ready for the day. You know what I thought too? I was thinking about North Korea, how I was talking about yesterday. Um, North Korea, there's probably a reason why it's so heavily armed is because they look at the rest of the world and they're like, we would like to keep you the fuck out of here. After I don't blame them. Song, I like to sit down with my students in a circle. And this is the time when I start to talk about some of the behaviors that I've seen. Maybe if it's some class issues that I need to correct. And then I also just give my kids the opportunity to just to have some shout outs. So that they and I'm wondering if the people who get shot when they're leaving the country are shot because the people who are shooting them don't know if they're a threat or not. Or why they're running. I don't know. And I could be getting myself in a lot of trouble for just asking these questions or making these statements. But to, to be clear, as I stated in my last video, I've never been to North Korea. Wait, did I say that in my last video? I said it sometime recently in the last few days. I've never been to North Korea. I have no experience. I've on, only what I've seen on the internet and on TV. And uh, we all know how reliable that can be compared to things that you've actually experienced in real life share some things that are happening with them then we'll move into our morning message and this is a time where my kids and I are coming together and we're talking about some of those phonics skills mm -hmm. so now I've transitioned my morning message from me actually writing it out and us going through each word to now my kids sharing out something we pound it out for the sentence and then I have them come up and do some shared writing after that we like to get some wiggles out with go noodle Go noodle. I mean, who doesn't love that, right? All right, let's go noodle. So once we got our wiggles out, we sit back down on the carpet and it's time for our writing mini lesson. So this is the time where I like to do a mini lesson. I'll read a book typically, or we're reviewing one of our mentor texts, and then I'd like to model some of that writing. 
Once we model it, we may do a little bit of shared writing with it. And then after that, we'll start to make our way into independent practice. So during independent practice, I give my kids the option of sitting wherever they choose. The majority of them like to sit at their table, which is really funny. I like to see how my classes vary up. So this is a time where I'm walking around, making sure that all of my kids are pretty much understanding what they need to be doing. Mm. Then I will make my way into my writing conferences. And I usually take it to where I can do one data binder during my writing conference. This, this is where we're reviewing some of their learning. And then I can also make some assessments at this time during their, in their data binders. So at 9.35 on the dot, we line up so that we can make our way to specials. Today, we are making our way to library. Mm. My kids absolutely love library time. So I get 30 minutes of planning time, and this is a time where I start to get myself ready for my reading um, workshop. I like to make sure that everything is ready to go because once we get in, I mean, it is gung-ho reading all the way. So I take out all of my items for my small groups. If you haven't seen my Periscope on my small group buckets, check it out. It is fantastic. The teacher's working overtime because not only has is she very organized and on top of her day with her students so far, and we're only five minutes into the video, six minutes into the video, she has these links to all these different videos that correspond with what she's talking about that keep popping up every few every minute or so. So she's providing us with other resources to be able to do what she's modeling. Then I like to just go over my calendar, make sure that I don't have anything planned, make sure there aren't any drills or any meetings that I need to be attending for the day. I'll also make my way to my laptop, check my emails to check. So I hate to put her in this position. But from my perspective, she seems like an extremely good teacher. She seems to be caring. The videos that she showed me so far, the children are happy to be there. But what if one day these children decide that they were manipulated and brainwashed into following this schedule and they do all the things that I talked about from my last video. They talk about how the library, they were forced to only read the books that the school provided and you know, they just went in with the whole cult narrative. Hold on, this is what I wanted to do. Cult narrative. Uh, no, signs of a cult. Yep, we're just gonna look at that. Absolute authoritarianism without accountability. You think that students can't talk, can't say that about schools? Zero tolerance for criticism or questions. You think students can't say that about some of their teachers? Lack of meaningful financial disclosure regarding budget. Well, children never ask about how much money things cost. Or if they do, they're not going to get clear answers from people who don't want them, who don't know how to handle those questions. Unreasonable fears about the outside world that often involve evil conspiracy and persecutions. Uh, stranger danger. A belief that former followers are always wrong for leaving and there is never a legitimate reason for anyone else to leave. So anytime a student has to leave a school because of behavioral issues, we're taught that it's a good thing. Abuse of members. Records, books, articles, or programs documenting the abuses of the leader or group. Followers feeling they are never able to be good enough our grade system can fall into this category if we wanted it if we if we wanted to use that narrative and then aren't there some schools that get rid of grades because of this narrative a belief that the leader is right at all times this is absolutely something that can be applied to schools and teachers not all teachers but some certain circumstances a belief that the leader is the exclusive means of knowing truth or giving validation if you present an argument that the teacher hasn't considered yet you might get backlash that you weren't expecting if they're not good at handling multiple perspectives at one time. So let's say that a student in her class talks to somebody <laughs> like me, no, not like me, but somebody who has this perspective on schools in general and 
takes the time and the effort and the energy to gain that child's trust or that young adult's trust and slowly and viciously manipulates them into looking at their education through this lens. And this teacher is the one that they point the finger to because she's sweet, she's kind, she's prepared, and they probably expect her to not be the kind of person who's going to fight back. And, uh, then you, how would, has she supposed to respond to that? She's going to deny it, obviously. Because they're basically, the narrative they can use is, well, she's part of a system that brainwashes you into believing that being a teacher is good and you're doing good for the students. But you're actually forcing them to do unpaid manual labor. And brainwashing them. And, uh, then she holds up her videos of all the students who loved her teaching style. Like, how is she supposed to be able to respond in this situation? And when I was thinking about making this video, I thought about making the joke of, like, I want to give the children ideas. I want to fill their head with ideas about this, but I don't because I don't want you to be living a life that someone else designed to the best of their ability based on the information they had at hand about what was good and what was harmful. And then you grow up in that environment with the only context being your experiences in that environment. And then somebody has a different opinion and they take advantage of your lack of experience in the world. And then they use that as a way to further their own opinion about something. Whether mere or from experience. These 10 things can be applied to any system in the world because, because absolute authoritarianism without accountability. How much transparency and visibility do you have into the accountability that other people are being held to at any given time? Zero tolerance for criticism or questions. What kind of questions? What kind of criticism? Any or just the ones that are extremely disrespectful and rude and they're actually trying to teach you manners and critical thinking, not just um, criticism based on wanting to rebel but not really being able to make your argument. Lack of meaningful financial disclosure regarding budget. <laughs> Whose business is this? At what level do you need to be aware of how much people are spending in what regard? And are some people being disclosed to it? Just not you because you're not, you don't need to know. Children don't need to know how much schools are spending and they don't care doesn't mean they're not providing the information. It just means that they don't need to know or they don't have the context to even understand it to begin with. Unreasonable fears about the outside world that often involve evil conspiracies and persecutions. Bad stuff happens in the world. And sometimes people's way of helping you is uh, telling you that it happens and then telling you to avoid it because that's the best they've got. A belief that former followers are always wrong for leaving. And there is never a legitimate reason for anyone else to leave. But you get to choose to believe that or not. Just because someone tells you that people left and they left for not good reasons, you have the free will at any, any age to contemplate and question and maybe people won't give you the information that you're looking for but that doesn't mean you can't keep an open mind to it and maybe what they're telling you is 100% true it's just you're putting an evil spin on it because that's what you do sorry Max I don't know how to make this more comfortable for you abuse of members what 
records, books, articles, or programs documenting the abuses of the leader or group. You have people in a system, <clears throat> and there's a hierarchy in that system. People are going to do what they think is right to do to maintain the boundaries and teach. And uh, sometimes that can be abusive. Sometimes it just seems abusive, and it's not actually abusive. People don't always do the right thing. That's not because of the group. It's because they probably think they're doing the right thing. It, they just have the wrong training or the wrong, their experience informs their decisions or their, in, their uh, not their instincts, but their, their past. Like if you are in a situation between an adult and a child and the child does something that the adult's not expecting and the adult just reacts that adult can really hurt that child that they don't have enough control over themselves or their emotions which is why I find martial arts to be beneficial for all humans because children who are trained in martial arts can protect themselves from an adult who reacts like that and an adult who's trained in martial arts can protect a child from their um, from themselves <clears throat> by developing the discipline that comes with it. Followers feeling they are never able to be good enough. That is an, a personal issue that we all have to overcome at some point. A belief that the leader is right at all times, but where is the belief coming from? Is the leader telling you that they're right at all times and you're choosing to believe it? Does the leader believe that they're right at all times and that's why they're leading you? A belief that the leader is the exclusive means of knowing truth or giving validation. Well, if they're leading an organization, they probably have a level of experience that you don't. So, they probably know some things and they're probably able to validate some things. Hmm. Do they believe they're the exclusive means of knowing these things? Who believes that? The followers? Why do you believe that about somebody else? Stop it. Most people don't recognize the group they're joining is considered a cult. Individuals who are attracted to groups that are considered cults may have certain vulnerabilities that make them more likely to join, such as anxiety or substance abuse problems. They're looking for someone who's stronger than them in the world to help them navigate it in a way that's effective. They have unresolved insecurities, don't we all? Ow! Even the leaders of these cults probably have unresolved insecurities. They are manipulated into joining. This is so annoying. What they're describing here is an abusive relationship. But even in an abusive relationship, you as the abused are the one who is choosing to end your relationships with other people because they're not fitting into your relationship with the abuser. Now the difference between you and I, me being someone who just stops talking to people when our conversations stop being productive more often than not, is that you are cutting people off because they're... Ah. Ow, stop. Well, actually, it could be the same. You could be really getting annoyed with people telling you that you're being brainwashed by your significant other. But if your significant other is telling you to end those relationships and you're choosing to do it, you're still choosing to do it. If they're telling you to do it because the relationships aren't good for your mental health, that's different than if they're telling you to do it because they don't want other people influencing their your relationship. But can I like I'm having trouble even explaining this because every time I do, I'm considering two sides of the same coin. So this is all very you're using the same concepts to explain things that are not good or bad. Famous ex examples of cults. I 
I don't know. I'm not going to drag this poor teacher into this anymore. But, like, what would her defense be if that situation came up? Are there, is there any insight that I can leave you with at this point? Because I want to clarify, if you're in an abusive relationship with somebody, you still are choosing to do the things that you then blame your abuser for doing. Now, I'm not talking about if they're hitting you or if they're emotionally damaging you in some way. But you're the one who's choosing to end your relationship with other people because you want to preserve your relationship with this person. How does that make them more powerful than you in the situation? If you are constantly defending your significant other against your family, is it what are they upset about? Is it because you were happier before you started seeing them? Because I've been with men who they weren't outright abusive, but they were so mentally unhealthy that their instability in life was making my mental health worse. I was drained because I was up all night dealing with their stuff. And I didn't cut my family off, but they, my, like, people could see me and they were concerned about my well being. Now, if I had gone to an extreme, I could have chosen to see myself as a victim in that situation and been like, I have to choose between them or my family or my boyfriend. And it's like, that choice was never something I had to make between any person I've ever dated and my family. Have I dated people that my family didn't like? Yes. Particularly because of the way that they treated me. But I trusted my family. Well, actually, I didn't trust my family until I was ready to let go of those people. But I never did not trust my family. I just didn't let their opinions influence how I saw my relationships because I wanted those relationships. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been in them. Until I got to the age where I did start letting it affect me because I started listening because I realized that I wasn't always right about things. Mm, there's cat hair in my nose. It's annoying. Maxi! So many points I'm trying to make, and every time I make one point, I think of it from a different perspective, and I'm getting myself confused. <sighs> I have so much cat hair in my nose right now, it's annoying. <sighs> Why are you shedding so much? Am I stressing you out? There's another thing I thought of that's not related to this, but it is related to a post that I made about um, relationships, which is if you are in a relationship with somebody and somebody else, let's say you're attracted to somebody else because that happens when you're dating one person. You might be attracted to somebody else and the other person is attracted to you. And your friends or whatever, you're part of the same friend group, whatever the case may be. And uh, the other person and you come up with a pact to date each other when you're both single. That's emotionally cheating on your significant other right there. And mentally cheating on them. You've just made an escape plan, so now you just all takes all... The only thing is it's just a matter of time. And you've disrespected your relationship with the first person. And, uh... 
it's time to end your relationship. If you have a friend who's constantly talking about how they want to date you when you're single, that person doesn't respect you. They don't respect your significant other. They don't respect your relationship. And most likely, they're just using you to see how powerful they are in the world. I wouldn't trust a person like that. I wouldn't want to be friends with them. I wouldn't want to date them. And I wouldn't want to see what happened after they actually got what they wanted. Because that sounds like a recipe for disaster. When you're building a relationship with somebody, you want it to be on a good start and a good foundation. Date single people only. If you're dating somebody who's cheating on somebody else, they don't respect themselves, they don't respect the person they're dating, and whether or not you think they're going to grow up after you two get together and things are going to change, I don't, I love gambling. That is not a risk I'm willing to gamble on. It's not even worth it to me. It's dumb. Date single people. I'm not saying every single person is healthy, but you're starting off on a better foot than dating somebody who's in a relationship with somebody else and disrespecting it probably more than once. But that's a lesson to learn in time through experience. And that's what we came here to do. Learn through experience. You also want to date people who are strong enough to be single. I don't judge anyone for being single. I judge people as unworthy of me dating them. when they cheat or try to negotiate around the fact that they are seeing someone else, leading someone else to believe that they want to be with them and then using me or vice versa. They're using both people in that situation. It's your life, it's your cause and effect, it's your karma. I want to be with someone who has the capacity to be in a healthy relationship, and in order to be in a healthy relationship, you have to be able to be single. And you have to be able to date. And you have to be able to know that you're okay if things go south. Because if you don't know that, then you can't really be fully yourself in a relationship with somebody else. You're always going to be trying to stay one step ahead of losing them, no matter what that means, or just one step ahead of not being single again, no matter what that means. And that's not a brilliant way to live in your relationships. Do I need to say any more on this subject before I go make my two other videos for the night? Because I think I want to make them tonight before I make them tomorrow morning. Or I want to make them tonight instead of making them tomorrow. What else do you need to hear? Who cares if people judge you for being single? I have been single for so long. I have been single since I got sober. And actually, I'm pretty sure the last boyfriend I had was in 2015.
I think he blocked me on Facebook. So I can't see our history. To tell you if it was 2014 or 2015. And I don't think I have any photos from that time. Oh, we climbed a mountain when? 2016. Oh, sweet. Okay, so I think it was 2014 that he and I dated. Not the people, not the people that I climbed a mountain with. That was a different, but that was a marker for. I think it was twenty fourteen, to be honest with you. Because if this wedding took place in twenty fifteen. And my boyfriend and I had a fight about Thanksgiving. It wasn't the same year that I went to the wedding with the man that I dated after him. <laughs> so, it must have been 2014. It's been a long time. I'm okay with the fact that I've been single for 10 years. <laughs> Holy shit. I've dated people in that time. I've dated quite a few people in that time. But it never got to the point after that where we were ex exclusive. And, uh, it's not that I want you to be single for 10 years. It's that I want you to be okay with the potential that you would be single for 10 years because in all that time, my life didn't stop. You know, I don't know what I've done in 10 years. I think I've told you a lot. And probably the most important thing I've done is getting to the point where I stopped trying to make the people that I like stay with me or want to be with me. Is it kind of sad to be single for 10 years? Yeah, it is kind of sad to be single for 10 years. It kind of sucks. Especially if you like relationships and you like all the stuff that comes with being with somebody exclusively. But part of the issue that I've been having is that I was trying to have that too soon. I had one boyfriend where things actually built up, but the way that they built up still led us to not having a healthy dynamic. So I've never really had like a healthy relationship with anyone. And it's from that relationship that I know it's not a good idea to talk to somebody else and talk about how you want to be together when you both are single. I just want to be with somebody who's kind of on the same page where we're both admitting that we're just figuring it out and we're going to do it together. That's probably the best you can do. And one of the things I was thinking about with teachers and students is like students don't realize how much teachers are trying to figure everything out in the moment or as a result of what they're planning and what they're doing. And so a lot of this cult accusations, it sounds to me just like kids who don't have context for what it's like to be an adult in the world. I'm really looking forward to being a mom. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, especially with the way Gen Alpha is. Gen Z is cool too, but their time is, their time has come. They're not being born anymore. Gen Alpha is awesome. 
They're all we're all awesome. Millennials are awesome. Gen Z is awesome. Gen Alpha is awesome. And then what's next? Gen Beta. That'll be fun. That'll be cute. Once you start to understand astrology and you understand how things ebb and flow, you kind of understand how just because we're different doesn't mean we're wrong. We're just different. And I don't know how old I'll be when I have children. If I have children, I won't hope to have them soon. I would love to have them soon, but I also don't want to rush anything. So, what else? I've got two meditations to record, which I'm super excited about and nervous about. But I feel really honored and blessed to have been chosen by myself to do them the way that I'm doing them. So I'm going to go do them now. And, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. We'll find out, I guess. Love you.